Let's take a few minutes to talk about proteins. Proteins are amino acid polymers. Uh, you could almost call them a polyamino acid, though we don't use that term. A short protein is often referred to as a peptide. And then uh, a protein in just its linear form is often referred to as a polypeptide. But in its linear form, it doesn't really have any function. As you can see in these two pictures, a protein really needs to be folded in order to have its, uh, its proper three-dimensional structure and therefore its proper function. So we've got a, a sequence, a series of covalently bound amino acids that's then folded back onto itself into a specific configuration. Think about what would cause it to fold back on itself. It's going to be the interactions among the different R groups of the various amino acids in that sequence. So um, if you look at the different R groups in your textbook, you can see that some are going to be attracted to each other, some are going to repel each other. Some will even form covalent bonds with one another. And all those attractions and, uh, and repulsions will lead to a stable, folded final shape or configuration. Now sometimes a folded protein will then interact with yet another folded protein or sometimes even many folded proteins to form the complete uh, what we call quaternary structure, the complete three-dimensional functional macromolecule. <clears throat> now take a minute and uh, try to think about some common protein functions. Maybe grab a piece of paper and pause this video and quiz yourself on some of the things that you know proteins are responsible for doing. And then after you've quizzed yourself and gotten as many as you can together, then go ahead and start this up again. All right, presumably you spent a few minutes putting together a, uh, a brainstormed list of common protein functions. Here's an example, although there are many, many different things that proteins do. Uh, one of the most important things is they act as catalysts for biochemical reactions. We call these enzymes, and we're going to look at enzymes in greater detail later. They can have structural roles. Uh, as an example, I think of the bacterial flagellum, the tail that is used to propel a cell through a liquid medium. That is a structural form of a protein, and it's not just a single protein. It's lots of folded proteins polymerized together, thousands of them in fact, polymerized together into a, a helical shape we call a flagellum. Many are involved in transport, in particular membrane transport, moving waste out of the cell, moving nutrients into the cell. That's all controlled by transport proteins. Um, most protein, or most uh, cells, rather, uh, including bacteria, have receptors on their surface where they can sense environmental conditions, things like oxygen concentration or glucose availability, maybe pH or salinity. Uh, or they can sometimes sense molecules that are being secreted, communication molecules, being released by other microbes, usually of the same species. Uh, the final example that I gave here are, are toxins. Toxins are toxic proteins. Uh, and they contribute to disease. And we're going to find that among bacterial pathogens, toxins are one of the more important, what we call virulence determinants or virulence factors, uh, molecules that, um, that contribute to their overall ability to cause disease. <clears throat> now we said at the very beginning that uh, the monomer of a protein is the amino acid. It's a, a carbon compound that has both an amino group and a carboxyl group we call um, carboxyl group related compounds, carboxylic acids, and so those two functional groups give this molecule its name, an amino acid. So again, I want you to hit pause on this video. I want you to test yourself and try drawing a structural formula of an amino acid. All amino acids are the same except for their variable R group. So where that variable R group is, just go ahead and put a big letter R and otherwise all the other uh, components to it are going to be identical from one amino acid to the next. So go ahead and hit pause. All right, I bet you anything you got it right. Here is a, a digital version of what an amino acid looks like. You've got your amino group on the left, carboxyl group on the right. That's, we just draw it that way by convention. If you flip those around, it's not a problem. That carbon in the middle, we call the central or alpha carbon. I find it's easiest to draw that, that alpha carbon in the middle and then put four covalent bonds around it and ask myself, okay, what are the four things it's attached to? I know it's on one side it's attached to amino group, on another side it's attached to a carboxyl group. 
Uh, a third position has just a proton, and a hydrogen uh, um, atom. And the fourth position is where the variable R group goes. And if we just put R there, we know that that implies uh, you know, one of 20 different possible um, uh, organic um, constructions that could be there. Take a look in your book at, at the 20 different R groups. You can see the different categories that they're in and the way that they behave. Don't try to memorize those, but this structure of amino acid you should be familiar with. You should recognize it, even if it's got an actual R group drawn in there. And you should be able to reproduce this drawing right here uh, if you're asked to. Now, how do these guys get polymerized? <coughs> um, the, the bond that's formed is called a peptide bond, and it's formed by a dehydration synthesis reaction. Uh, and it's the reaction between the carboxyl group of the growing polypeptide and the amino group of an incoming amino acid. So what you see here at the top is uh, you've got um, two amino acids linked together. Uh, the purple shows the backbone that's just repeating all the way down the length. Uh, the OH from the carboxyl group at one end of that growing polypeptide chain is removed, as is one of the hydrogens from the amino group of the incoming amino acid, and that comes off as water, and that's why we call it a dehydration synthesis reaction. We're synthesizing, we're forming a bond, and it's, it, it takes a dehydration to make it happen. We're removing water. Now, it wasn't there as water, but as it comes off, they're combined and it forms water. And what you see down below is the peptide bond that's left behind. So the peptide bond um, it connects the uh, what was once carboxyl carbon. It's a, now just a simple carbonyl group. And it attaches that directly to an amino nitrogen. We call that the peptide bond. You can see the backbone that's going to be repeating. You see the side chains, the variable R groups, just kind of hanging out in the breeze, giving essentially information or unique character to each position. And you notice that there are two ends to this molecule. You've got the amino end, where you have a free unreacted amino group. And you have the carboxyl end, where you have a free unreacted carboxyl group. That carboxyl end is where all the new amino acids that are being brought in at the ribosome are attached. So this molecule grows from its N terminus to its C terminus in that direction prior to, uh, prior to folding. Now with 20 different amino acids, let's take a really small protein of only 100 amino acids, and that is pretty small. That amounts to 1.3 times 10 to the 130th power possible combinations. And most proteins, it turns out, are considerably larger than that. So kind of like what we were talking about with nucleic acids and the incredible, practically infinite diversity uh, you could come up with to spell out a gene, uh, the, the truth is the same here with amino acids. You take a 1.13 1, 1, uh, 1, and then 129 zeros after it. Uh, that's how many possibilities there are just for building a simple, um, a simple protein. Uh, never mind a more typical one that's a bit more complex than this. So uh, the, the possibilities are practically endless. Now there are four levels of protein structure. We're going to move through these relatively quickly, but you need to become familiar with them. So here on the left, we've got a protein in its polypeptide formation, meaning it hasn't folded on itself. It's just sort of squiggly laying there. And you can see the amino terminus and the carboxyl terminus uh, indicated by the lysine and leucine at uh, amino acid 1 and amino acid 129. The primary sequence of a protein simply means the linear sequence of amino acids. Lysine, valine, phenylalanine, glycine, arginine, and so on down the line, all the way to your cysteine, arginine, and leucine at the carboxyl terminus. So if we talk about the primary sequence of a protein, this is what we mean. Simply the sequence, the order in which these amino acids are attached to each other by peptide bonds. <clears throat> now secondary and tertiary structure, levels of protein folding, are when you get interactions among the amino acids in the protein leading to it folding. So it's no longer just a linear chain, but those amino acids start interacting with each other. And they can be covalent bonds, ionic bonds, hydrogen bonds, or what we call hydrophobic interactions, where hydrophobic R groups are hiding from the aqueous phase and burying all of themselves together towards the center of a, the protein. And that's a very strong uh, folding pattern. Now there's a distinction between secondary and tertiary structure and the types of bonds each forms, but for our purposes we're not going to distinguish those. It's not particularly important for you. So now we've gone from a linear chain, our primary structure, to a folded globular protein. Now that protein, after it's folded to a tertiary level, 
uh, may actually have activity. It may be ready to go if that's all it takes. And, and a significant number of proteins are, do only have primary, secondary, and tertiary uh, structures. It's not too uncommon, though, to see quaternary structure. Quaternary structure is when two or more folded polypeptides interact to form a functional multi-subunit macromolecule. So you see hemoglobin here with multiple subunits. Some are identical and some are different from each other. Now any one of those individually doesn't have the activity of hemoglobin. It can't carry uh, CO2 away from the lungs. It can't carry oxygen to the cells. Only when all the subunits come together can it actually move gases around the way that it's designed to. When a protein requires multiple other proteins to interact together to form the final functional um, machine, if you will, we call that quaternary level of structure. So I hope this video was helpful for you. Uh, feel free to play it as many times as you need to as you study, and good luck.